or go downstairs to um, <clears throat> Peck Hall 207 to the study abroad office. All right, picking up with chapter four. And I'm going to try to go through this more quickly. Probably won't, but you know, we'll see what happens. Um, second paragraph. In chapter 4, What Lies Behind the Law. This is the second chapter of the first book, by the way. <clears throat> Lewis writes, Ever since men were able to think, they have been wondering what this universe really was and how it came to be there. Very roughly, two views have been held. Everybody knows this. Okay? First, what's called the materialist view. People who take this view think that matter and space just happen to exist and always have existed. But nobody knows why. I mean, this is essentially the, the Big Bang view. Something has always been here. Even when the Big Bang banged, there was something there before. It was infinitesimally small, and it banged. But five seconds before the Big Bang, something was there. Okay? But nobody knows why. Nobody knows why this stuff existed. And that the matter behaving in certain fixed ways has just happened by a sort of fluke to produce creatures like ourselves who are able to think. Now, evolutionary theory has changed a bit since the time when Lewis wrote this. We now have different approaches to evolution, according to which evolutionary biologists you talk to, because there are kind of a wide variety of uh, views about this. You know, to where now there is selective evolution, and I don't just mean, you know, um, selective breeding and kind of stuff, but where evolution kind of moves and fits and starts, and when it really takes off, it takes off, and there seems to be some kind of purpose behind it, but there's not really any purpose behind it because there's nothing else there, okay? The other view, Lewis says, at the end of that, well, I take that back, not the end of that paragraph, just a few sentences down. The other view is the religious view. According to it, what is behind the universe is more like a man than it is like anything else we know. That is to say, it has consciousness, there is purpose, and it prefers one thing over another. And then he goes on and says, wherever there have been people, both ideas have shown up. That doesn't matter the culture. Okay? You cannot find out which one is the right one by science. Why? Lewis doesn't necessarily say this, but it's essentially that Science never asks why. Never asks why. It only asks on answers. How? How does matter get transformed into heat, you know, through fire and such? It never asks why that happened. Never asks why 2 plus 2 equals 4. Okay? So he goes on. Uh, seven or eight more sentences down, and says why anything comes there comes to be there at all, and whether there is anything behind the things science observes, this is not a scientific question. Okay? So for, there are some astrophysicists who do want to ask the question, why was there something that blew up at the Big Bang? It's not a question they can answer according to astrophysics, or astronomy, or any other kind of theory. The statement that there is something that is something behind the beginning, and the statement that there is no such thing, are neither of the statements that science can make. Why? Because both those are statements of belief, or faith, if you want. To make, you know, here I'll step on some toes, possibly. To take Richard Dawkins's view, Okay, Richard Dawkins, a scientist, where, Cambridge? I think he's Cambridge, uh, in England, who uh, is one of the most vocal intellectual atheists in the world today, who has said, there is no God. Okay, and he argues that, he says, from a scientific perspective. Okay, the problem is science cannot make that kind of assertion. It cannot prove that kind of assertion. Okay? Just as a theologian who goes out and says, 
Here is the intellectual proof for God is always going to fail. Like Lewis, okay? In, um, what year was this? 1946, I believe it was. Lewis had a debate at Oxford in the, um, at the Oxford Union with a woman named Elizabeth Anstall. Okay? She was a philosopher, Catholic philosopher. And the point that they were debating was whether it was not, whether or not, it was logically possible to prove the existence of God. Lewis was arguing pro that you could logically prove the existence of God, and Anscombe was arguing con, that you cannot. Okay? According to those who were present at the debate, it wasn't filmed and it wasn't recorded. Unfortunately, I wish it had been. According to those who were present at the debate, they thought it was a draw, that neither side won. Lewis, however, tells us uh, in some letters, he thought she wiped the floor with him. He thought she just totally demolished his arguments. Okay, now this is this is huge <laughs> for anybody to demolish Lewis in an intellectual argument was unheard of. I mean, Lewis would go to the Oxford Union to debate people, and individuals would literally back away. They would, they would, uh, if Lewis is going to be there, I'm not showing up, kind of a thing. Because he's like a pit bull when it came to logic. He would take whatever position you took, he would see through the faults, the logical fallacies and such, and then just rip you to shreds. Okay, in this very kind of nice British manner, so to speak. Well, according to Lewis, Anscombe totally demolished him. Anscombe didn't think that. According to her letters, she thought it was a draw. She thought he gave as good as he took. Okay, but this this really shattered Lewis's reliance on logic, so that. And this does bear, and I can get off a little bit for this. So that what you really see in Lewis, if you if you study Lewis's life, is you have a you have an early Lewis, a mid Lewis, and a late Lewis. And the early Lewis, let's say, you know, from conversion, roughly 1931, to uh, about 45. About 1945, Mere Okay, then you have this mid Lewis about 1946, oh, until about the time of the last of the Chronicles of Narnia. Okay, about 1954, 55. Okay, and then the late Lewis is about 1956 until his death in 1963, and I should have mentioned. Um, well, actually, coming up, what is it? We actually have class that day? No, we don't. Yeah, day before, oh, well, um, day after Thanksgiving. It's 23rd, isn't it? No, it's 22nd. It's Thanksgiving Day. Is the 39th? 63. 63 would be 50, yeah, be 50 years next year. 49th. 49th anniversary of the death of. On the same day, C.S. Lewis, JFK, and Aldous Huxley. Okay? Um, but anyways, what you get in this is, in this period, is what I call kind of the, the logical, reason-oriented C.S. Lewis. It's during this period, for example, he writes screw tape, heavily dependent upon reason. He writes mere Christianity. He writes, the problem of pain. Okay. This is an intellectual argument for why pain exists, why it's necessary, and why God allows it. That takes something to kind of try to make that kind of an argument. Okay. Because keep in mind, when he's making this argument, problem of pain, I think it is 43 or 44, it's right in the middle of World War II. 
Pain is all around. And here he is trying to logically argue, well, this is why pain is necessary for human existence. It draws us closer to God. Kind of hard to tell that to people who lost Johnny off in the war. Okay? Mid-period begins... My, this, is, this is my reading of Lewis. Begins with this debate. <laughs> when he essentially loses. And what this does is it kind of causes him to start questioning his reliance on logic. Or, let me rephrase that, his over-reliance on logic. All right? And that goes through Chronicles of Narnia. Why does it go through Chronicles of Narnia? If you've read the Chronicles of Narnia, how often in those novels do you see someone try to reason someone else into believing in the existence of Aslan, for example. It doesn't necessarily. I mean, there are some things like that, beginning, you know, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. Um, Lucy goes off. She discovers Narnia. She meets Edmund there. Edmund comes back. Lucy comes back. They tell Peter and Susan, and Edmund says, oh, we were just joking, etc." So Peter and Susan then go see Professor Kirk, the old guy who owns the house that they're staying at. And Professor Kirk applies a little bit of logic. He says, okay, you have your little brother and your little sister. Now, which one normally would you say tells the truth? Well, that's easy. That's Lucy. Okay, so you're saying Edmund usually lies. Uh -huh. So why do you now all of a sudden believe him and not her? Well, because she's talking about this makeup world in the wardrobe. I mean, that's completely crazy, isn't it? I don't know, is it? She usually tells the truth. He usually lies. Well, but that's impossible. Is it? How do you know? Have you gone in all the wardrobes of the world? <laughs> okay, that's logic that he's applying there. All right? And then he goes on and talks about Plato and stuff. So what you begin to see in, for example, in Chronicles of Narnia, is in a, a movement away from this emphasis on pure logic to, for lack of a better word, an emotional, or you can maybe even call it a mythical, okay? These terms are means of arriving at truth. Okay? So now you have more of an emotional or mythical approach to truth. Okay? This doesn't mean, however, that in this early period, you didn't have any emotional or mythical approach to truth. You're going to see when we get to space trilogy, hopefully, if we get to it. Um, you're going to see this one passage where this character Ransom is going to talk about Myth, fact, and truth, and how they're all related, okay? And then you get to this period. Between the end of Chronicles of Narnia, the last Chronicles of Narnia, and the next thing, next fictitious thing Lewis writes, okay, which is surprise, um, not surprised by the way, till we have faces, Lewis suffers writer's block. Which is amazing when you think about it. Because, I mean, during this period, he's just churning out books. It's disgusting. It's like he doesn't even have to think. He just sits down and, you know, writes. And they come. Okay? Well, he suffers writer's block. But then he also meets Joy David Gresham. And initially, she's kind of pushy and he's not, you know, nothing happens. But he does eventually marry her. And an idea that he's been kicking around early 1930s, a retelling of the myth of Cupid and Psyche, okay, suddenly comes. And he writes that retelling, uh, Till We Have Faces, and it's almost totally different from anything else Lewis had ever written. Because it's not heavily dependent upon reason, though there is a character in it who is Mr. Logical. It's not heavily dependent upon emotion, though there is a character in it 
who is entirely emotional. But then there's also a character who's a wonderful blend of the two. Okay? So this is a mix of these. And then towards the end of this, you get the last thing he writes before he actually dies. And this is published while he's alive. I don't know if any of you have ever read it before. A Grief Observed. Anybody read that before? Okay. Which is written after the death of his wife. Okay. A woman he met about four years previously. He met her in about 54 or 55. She had written some letters to him. Moves to London. Kind of, you know, insinuates herself into his life. Gets cancer. They get married. They have a civil marriage so that she cannot be sent back to the United States. Okay. Then after she recuperates to some extent, they have a formal religious marriage. In other words, it's like the civil marriage, that was just for the state, but the religious marriage is for them. Because at this point, Lewis now loves her. Here's a guy who's been a bachelor all his life. As he says, you know, happy bachelor. He likes being a bachelor. And this woman comes into his life and turns everything upside down. And in the grief observed, you hear the cry of a heart that is missing its better half. Right? And that is crying, not down here to us, but upstairs. Why? I mean, he addresses God. Why did you bring her into my life if you were only going to rip her away from me a few short years later? Ooh, whatever happened to problem of pain, Mr. Smarty Pants? <laughs> Who had all the answers? Or all the answers given in mere... All of that logical, rationalistic, philosophical approach to God, when the rubber meets the road, doesn't mean squat. Okay? And I think what it shows is, you know, Lewis is pretty smart. <laughs> Probably he would be count regarded genius. Okay? But all that genius doesn't get him anywhere <laughs> until he lives it. Okay? Until he really experiences everything he's writing about. I have no idea how I got off on that. Um, so, back to where we were on page chapter four. About, what, third paragraph in? <laughs> um, he goes on and talks, here's where I'm going to start skipping a bunch that I normally wouldn't. He goes on and talks about how, you know, what we've been saying is that there are the two views. There's the one, the materialist view, and there's two, the religious view, okay? And he says, anybody studying man from the outside, um, skipping a bit, would never get the slightest evidence that we had this moral law that is looking at us only from our outside without having some kind of clue into what's going on in the mind. How could he? For his observations would only show what we did. Right? When you do something wrong, do your actions actually show that there's any kind of internal struggle? No. Because you go ahead and do it. There's a big difference if you stopped doing it. But that still wouldn't say that there's an internal struggle. It would just show that you didn't do something. So Lewis says, in the same way, if there are anything above or behind the observed facts in the case of stones or the weather, we, by studying them from outside, could never hope to discover it. That is, if there were some kind of internal mechanism, we couldn't know what it was. So he says, let's turn that around. We want to know whether the universe simply happens to be what it is for no reason or whether there is some power behind it that makes it what it is. People still want to know the answer to that question. Okay? If that power exists, that is, if there is something behind what is, you know, um, Arda, let's say, it would not be one of the observed facts, but a reality which makes them. And therefore, no mere observation of the facts can find it. And he's going to use, in just a moment, 
That is equivalent of saying, well, let me just read what he says. There's only one case in which we can know whether there is anything more, namely our own case. In other words, we can only argue from ourselves. So what does that mean? If there was a controlling power outside the universe, it could not show itself to us as one of the facts inside the universe. Why? <laughs> because it's outside. No more than the architect of a house could actually be a wall or a staircase or a fireplace in that house. Right? What does a house show you? It does show design. It does show movement in terms of going from one level to another level. It does show intellect. But is the intellect still there, so to speak? You don't go in and say, hello, Mr. Architect who designed my house, and the house speaks back to you, unless you're in a weird house. <laughs> I don't want a smart house like that. The only way which we can expect it to show itself would be inside ourselves, as an influence or a command trying to get us to behave in a certain way. All right? So, Lewis, skipping several lines, says, the only thing I can look at to try to figure out if there's something back here is us. <clears throat> because after all, can we get inside the mind of a cat? Not that there's anything there. <laughs> Sorry. Lauren's like, how dare you? <laughs> no, we can't. Okay. Can we really even truly get inside the mind of another individual? Hmm, that's kind of hard. So we have ourselves. When I do, that is open myself, especially when I open the particular man called myself, I find that I do not exist on my own, that I am under a law. Somebody or something wants me to behave in a certain way. Why? Because we have this feeling of oughtness, Lewis says. So, skip a little bit. He says, don't get ahead of me. I'm not yet within a within a hundred miles of the God of Christian theology. All I've got to is something directing the universe, which appears to me as a law term to me. Nor is it Brahma, nor is it it's you know think life force or the force if you want. To, okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip the rest. Go on to number five, chapter five. Uh, he talks about talking about a clock, and he says, um, talking about putting the clock back, second paragraph, would you think I was joking if I said that you can put a clock back, and that if the clock is wrong, it is often a very sensible thing to do? Yes. If you go home and your clock says that it's reading 10 minutes fast, it's a smart thing to put it on the correct time. Or if it's running two hours fast, unless you have an appointment and you want to make sure you don't forget, you know, that kind of thing. People setting multiple alarms. And... No, he says, we all want progress. But progress means getting nearer to the place you want to be. Notice, progress is not just forward movement. Because we... I've had students before, not in this level of class, but I've had writing students before. I'm not kidding. I, if we had a stack of Bibles in here, I would swear on it. I had one student in a writing course that was taking that writing course for his 12th time. He'd failed it 11 times. Okay. He was moving forward, but was he getting any closer to his destination? Well, in those previous 11 times, he wasn't. He you know, it was like a hamster in the wheel, just going, going, going. Okay? So, if you've taken a wrong turning, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. If you're on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn, walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive man. I mean, just think politics and let that sit Sink in your mind, because it doesn't matter whether you're right or left, okay? You get any closer to what is your ultimate goal. No, you keep going further and further and further down that wrong road. So, 
There's nothing progressive about being pig-headed and refusing to admit a mistake. This is what Lewis did after he debated Elizabeth Anscombe. He finally realized, you know, maybe logic can't take you everywhere. In other words, he reached the conclusion that Dante reached approximately 700 years previously. When Dante had Virgil only take him up to the entrance into purgatory. Why? Because Virgil wasn't Christian. Virgil didn't have the answers. Virgil didn't have revelation per se. And Dante thought, medieval Catholic perspective, just pure knowledge, pure rationality and logic can only get you so far. What do you have to have? Faith to make that next step. All right? So he says, I think if you look at the present state of the world, Keep in mind, this is like 1942. It is pretty plain humanity has been, has been making some big mistake. We are on the wrong road. Interesting, that sentence, and then move it forward to today. Are we still on the wrong road? Have we gone backwards and, you know, I mean, think of what happened shortly after this. I mean, the United States detonated the first nuclear bomb. Okay. Two of them were used against Japan. And then we had the whole nuclear arms race, which got pretty hot and hairy there for a while. I mean, we just ce celebrated a week or so ago the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which, you know, in terms of the doomsday clock, got us to like 10 seconds to midnight. Which, boom. <laughs> I mean, that was pretty close, right? We're on the wrong road. So, if that is so, we must go back. Well, how far back do you have to go? To where you took the wrong turn. What does that mean you must realize? Where did I go wrong? Okay. So, skipping on down several lines, he says, um, we're not taking anything from the Bible or the churches. We're trying to see what we can find about this our own steam. That is, on the basis of logic, not on the basis of some preacher preaching something somewhere. He says, okay, so we've got two bits of evidence about this somebody, this mind, let's say. One is the universe that's out there. Everything we see around us, look in a telescope and everything we see out there. Look in the Hubble telescope and everything you see even way, way, way out there. Now, astronomers tell us, going all the way back to, what's the earliest um, one they say they found? About one point, I think it's 1.2 billion years after the Big Bang. They found a galaxy that far back in time. It's either 1.2 billion years or it's um, 600 million, I mean, which is like a drop of time in the bucket, so to speak. So, if we use that, Jen, is just what we see around us, as our only clue, then we should have to conclude that he was a great artist. Why? Open the windows, look at the beauty around you outside. Trees, all different colors, you know, people, all that kind of stuff. But also that he's quite merciless and no friend to man. Well, where's the evidence for that? Oh, Hurricane Sandy! <laughs> What is it now? I think I heard today 65 people dead. You know, the breezy point in New York, over 111 houses destroyed. Okay. So many million people still without power. I mean, power is nothing. 65 people dead. Let's just, you know, leave it at that. Or even one person dead. Just because what does that mean for all the people who know that one person? Life has totally and completely changed from that moment on. It will never be the same, okay? Merciless. If that's all we had to go on. Why is God, you know, where is God when bad things happen? Well, if this was all we're told, then your answer would have to be, doesn't matter. This is the way things are, period. But there's another bit of evidence. The moral law that he's put into our minds. Notice how Lewis slips into an error. He. Why he? 
Because even though he says, we're not talking about the Christian God, up here he's thinking it. So it should be, it has put into our minds. Okay? Well, what does the moral law say? This isn't how it should be. People aren't supposed to die. Life is not supposed to be unfair. So you find out more about him from the moral law than from the universe in general. Just as you find out more about a man by listening to his conversation than by looking at a house he has built. Every one of you, I bet if rather than writing that paper and turning it into me, like we did, if we did this the Oxford way or the Cambridge way, and you came into my office, and you stood there, because that's how they do it, and you stood there, and you read me your paper, and I had a copy of it in front of me, so that I could mark it up, and then I fired questions at you, I bet every one of you would have received an A on your papers. Okay. Why? Because you could then explain. It wasn't a matter of me trying to divine what it was you meant. You know, like I have a Ouija board over here. Eh, okay. <laughs> so from the second bit of evidence, Lewis says, we conclude that the being behind the universe is intensely interested in what? Right conduct, fair play, unselfishness, courage, good faith, honesty, truthfulness. Why? Why those things? Why is it that he's not unfair play? SOBiousness. <laughs> wrong mindedness because whatever that moral standard is it tells us selfishness really is bad okay you know where do we see examples go back to 9-11 the real one not the recent one in Benghazi but we could talk about that one too Look at some of the unselfish acts that were shown and how people respond to them. And I don't just mean cops. I mean individuals who are not paid, who are not expected to do anything different, put their lives in jeopardy by helping somebody in a wheelchair go down 90 floors on stairs, carrying something. That's a totally unselfish act. Doesn't do any good to the individual carrying somebody else to do that. Or somebody waiting with somebody else until help arrived. And we have stories we know where that happened and never arrived. So two people died when only one needed to. All right? The moral law doesn't give us any grounds for thinking God is good in the sense of being as Lewis describes it, indulgent or soft or sympathetic. There's nothing indulgent, he says, about the moral law. Why? Because the moral law, he says, is hard as nails. In other words, there is only good and ungood. In other words, it's not a scale. <laughs> it's, it's not a curved grade. You know where you can be 93% uh, good and that's good enough. Or 89.5%. 6% good, and that bumps you up to that 90% A, which is acceptable good. Okay? It's no use at this stage, he goes on, saying that what you mean by good God is a God who can forgive. Because he says only a person can forgive. So far, we're not talking about a person. Only this standard, this being, force, whatever you want to call it. Okay? So, um, boy, do I need to talk about that? The sentence, on the other hand. Oh, my throat's getting off. Or on the other hand, we know that if there does exist an absolute goodness, okay, notice an absolute goodness, not a mostly good. If there does exist, I'm going to choke on this thing, I just know it. If there does exist an absolute goodness, 
It must hate what most it must hate most of what we do. Well, that's rather extreme, isn't it? Is is most of what you do and it's most of what Andrea does in her life bad? Is that the kind of person you are? I mean we are in. If the universe is not governed by an absolute goodness, then all our efforts are in the long run hopeless. By an absolute goodness. If it is, then we're making ourselves enemies to the goodness every day and are not the least likely to do any better tomorrow. And so our hope case is hopeless again. In other words, we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. We cannot do without it and we cannot do with it. God is the only comfort. He's also the supreme terror. You need an example of this in actual literature? Read almost anything written by Flannery O'Connor. For example, um, good man is hard to find. I mean, she, she nails that idea perfectly. Okay? Or even in one of her letters, when she writes, I write the way I do, not though I'm a Catholic, but because I am a Catholic. Notice the huge difference there. So, God's the only comfort. He's also the supreme terror. The thing we most need and the thing we most want to hide from. He is our only possible ally. We've made ourselves his enemies, etc. Skip on to the next paragraph, going about the third sentence. When I chose to get to my real subject in this roundabout way, he says, so I did so for a reason. My reason was that Christianity simply does not make sense until you face the sort of facts I've been describing. In other words, notice what he's saying about Christianity. That's the point he wants to get to. But he doesn't just get to it by saying, just believe. You know, just feel good about yourself or feel good about the thing in the corner that you're kind of you know, praying to a la screw tape. No. He says Christianity tells people to repent and promise them, promises them forgiveness. It has nothing to say to people who do not know they've done anything to repent of and who do not feel that they need any forgiveness. So if someone doesn't think they've done anything wrong and they don't feel like they need any forgiveness, Christianity is completely irrelevant to them. This is why he spent the first three chapters saying, guess what? You have done something wrong, and you are in need of something. Okay? It is after you have realized there is real moral law and a power behind the law that you've broken that law and put yourself wrong with that power. It's only after you've done all this that Christianity begins to talk. But Lewis doesn't address this, but I'm going to. But does that mean you've got to go through all the process that he did here? To talk to someone who's from a non-Western country? A, a non-Christian world? Or even a non, not even non-Western, non-Eastern. A primitive society, let's say. Do you have to go through and say, okay, now let's sit down and let's logically reason our way through this? No. Why not? What makes it immediately easier, following Lewis's logic, if one set out to do what Lewis was doing, sorry, that thing's sticking all over. What makes it infinite easier to... Talk to somebody from Haiti or Papua New Guinea or some other culture that, say, practices voodoo than it is to talk to a philosopher from Cambridge. Well, the voodoo practitioner already does what? Believes in God or God. Yeah already acknowledges there's something else there, period. 
Doesn't matter what that something else is. Okay? So, now Lewis goes on. Skipping several more lines. Here's what I'm doing. All I'm doing is to ask people to face the facts. To understand the questions which Christianity claims to answer. They're terrifying facts. I wish it was possible to say something more agreeable. But I must say what I think true. And he goes on and says, but I think the Christian religion is comforting. Okay? If you, skipping a bit again, if you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. If you look for comfort, you will not get either comfort or truth. Only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin with, and in the end, despair. Now, Look at what that sentence means. If you look for truth, what is true? Okay, You may notice, find comfort in the end. Is he saying you will? No. No. You still may find death and darkness. But if you begin by only looking for comfort, because what is comfort? that which puts us at ease. <laughs> that which makes us feel that everything isn't so bad. Then he says, what will you get? You won't get comfort, and you won't get truth. What's an example of someone who either only seeks comfort, or who is only given comfort, and not truth? Uh, children. Keep going. During World War Two. Keep going. Explain. Um, uh, well, okay. Well, truth. Uh, truth is by its very nature on occasion uncomfortable. Truth and comfort don't necessarily have anything in, in particular to do with each other. Um, you may, in fact, find comfort in this world, but uh, it's orthogonal to truth. Um, it's not apples and oranges. It's apples and oil changes. <laughs> Good way of putting it. What about the parent who only tells their children or child it will be okay? You know, sometimes in life it isn't okay. Or someone who tells their child because their parent hasn't come home yet for some reason. Everything will be all right. And mommy or daddy never come home. <laughs> It ain't going to be all right. Life may go on. But that doesn't mean it's going to be all right. Okay? So, most of us have got over the pre-war wishful thinking about international politics. What's the pre-war wishful thinking he's talking about? That there didn't have to be <coughs> 1938, Neville Chamberlain flies back from Berlin, waves a piece of paper in the air, to the newsman and says, I have bought peace in our time. It lasted a year. And then all hell broke loose that made the previous all hell that broke loose look like a you know kindergarten spat. Okay. That's why Lewis then says, it's time we did the same about religion. Just as we've gotten over our pre-war wishful thinking about international politics, Okay. He says, we've got to get over the same kind of thinking about religion. So we come to book two, which is notice, what Christians believe. Okay, He's addressing Christians. Why? Because England is, 1942, primarily a Christian nation. I still, it still blows my mind to think that the BBC wanted him to do this. So he says, if you are a Christian, you do not have to believe that all the other religions are simply wrong all through. There's something that could be said loudly a lot more frequently. I heard, you know, heard somebody the other day call him some talk radio show. I can't remember what it was. And the person, um, the talk radio person said, you know, 
something. Are you Catholic? And the respondent goes, oh, no, I'm Christian. <laughs> and I thought, okay. And then, like, three seconds later, she goes, oh, well, I guess I should say I'm Protestant. You know, because Catholics are Christian, too. But, I mean, it was that, that interval between, no, I'm a Christian, and then, oops, <laughs> caught me, okay, showed everything about the person's mindset. So, if you're a Christian, you are free to think that all those religions, even the queerest ones, contain at least some hint of the truth. Remember Tolkien's little thing in the fairy story essay about the thousand, or about the splintered light? Okay. This is Lewis's notion that, you know, all religions have some element of the truth. Okay? So, he goes on and talks about when he was an atheist. And when Lewis was an atheist, he'd make um, Dawkins, the guy I talked about earlier, again, look like a grade school atheist compared to what Lewis was. He says, I had to try to persuade myself that most of the human race have always been wrong about the question that mattered to them most. When I became a Christian, I was able to take a more liberal view. But of course, being a Christian does mean thinking that where Christianity differs from other religions, Christianity is right and they are wrong. Apply this to any other aspect of life, and you would say, well, that's duh, that's true. Okay. For example, let's say you're a socialist. And you would say, probably, that where your socialist belief differs from a Republican's, you would say, well, it's because I'm right and you're wrong. Or if you're a Democrat, you would say where you differ from a Republican is where you are right and they are wrong. In other words, we tend to think that what we believe is right. And what somebody else believes, when it's in conflict, is therefore wrong. It's only in really the last 20 years that this mentality has spread that we can both be entirely right. Okay, Which is an example of what from George Orwell? Double think. The idea that you can hold two at simultaneously two diametrically opposed ideas and believe them both. Okay? Orwell isn't taught very much in universities anymore, but man, he ought to be required reading. Because when you talk about propaganda, he's the master in terms of understanding how language is abused. I'd really encourage you, if you've never read it before, read his little essay, Politics and the English Language. It's just sheer brilliance. Okay? So, Lewis goes on. Talks about the division of humanity into the people who believe in God or gods and those who don't. So he says... Now let's go on to the next big division. People who all believe in God can be divided according to the sort of God they believe in. Makes sense. Different ideas on this subject. One of them is the idea that God is beyond good and evil. These people would say that the wiser you become, the less you would want to call anything good or evil. And the more clearly you would see that everything is good in one way and bad. That is, good and evil are merely two sides of the same coin. It all depends on your perspective. So, you know, what's good for these people over here might be bad for these people over here, and vice versa. The other and opposite idea is that God is quite definitely good or righteous. A God who hate a God, sorry, who takes sides, who loves, who loves, I should just stop now, who loves love and hates hatred, who wants us to behave in one way and not another. The first of these views, the one that says God is beyond good and evil, pantheism. Okay? Held by the great, you know, he mentions Hegel and others. The other view is the view held by Jews, Mohammedans, or Muslims as we would call them, and Christians. Okay? Pantheists usually believe that God animates the universe as you animate your body. That is, the universe is God. So that if it did not exist, he would not exist either. And anything you find in the universe is part of God. According to a, a really true, strict pantheist, 
This is God. This is God. Reach down in your pocket. The lint you pull out, that's God. Okay. Everything is all part of God. Okay. Get that part clear. Christian idea says it's a bit different. God invented and made the universe like a man making a picture or composing a tune. The picture, obviously, isn't the man. In other words, you can look at a painting by Rembrandt. And usually, you can see Rembrandt in it, because he always puts himself in most of his paintings. Okay? But the painting is not Rembrandt, obviously. And if you destroyed the painting, Rembrandt wouldn't cease to be. But if you destroyed Rembrandt, and he hadn't painted yet, nothing else would be. Okay? So, if you don't take the distinction between good and bad very seriously, skipping a few lines, then it's easy to say that anything you find in this world is a part of God. Now notice that. If you don't take the distinction between good and bad seriously, then you say it's all part of God. It's all what is meant to be, in other words. The pantheistic idea is almost a fatalistic idea, or deterministic. It's, it's what happens, period. So, confronted with cancer or a slum, the pantheists say, if you could only see it from the divine point of view, you would realize that this also is God. Okay? Christian replies, don't talk damn nonsense. And the modern Christian probably says, don't talk damn nonsense, and slaps him. Okay? For Christianity is a fighting religion. It thinks God made the world, space, time, he called, all that kind of stuff. But it also thinks that a great many things have gone wrong with the world that God made, and that God insists, and says very loudly, on our putting them right again. In other words, so that when some great human catastrophe happens, God doesn't go, eh, say la vie. <laughs> That's life. But it's upset and expects people to do something, but it's not his fault. Okay? He's going to talk about that he's got a fault later. So, if a good God made the world, why has it gone wrong? If God is so great, and God is so all-powerful, and God is so good, why is there evil? Why is there suffering? Why do children get cancer and die? Why do uh, wacko people fly planes into the ocean? I just saw a thing Yesterday, I think it was. Yesterday was the... Uh, this is 2012? 15th anniversary, I think. Of TWA Flight 800. I think it was TWA Flight 800. The one that took off from New York and disappeared somewhere over Newfoundland. And wow. pilot got up to use the restroom. And the black box records, the very next thing was the co-pilot saying something to the effect of, um, this is from memory, it wasn't Allahu Akbar, it was English, but it was, I trust in God, I trust in God, I trust in God, and that was it. <laughs> and, you know, NTSB said, well, we don't really know what happened in this flight. Doesn't take a lot of, you know, stretch of the imagination. So... If a good God made the world, why has it gone wrong? Lewis, for many years, I simply refused. Notice this I here. I refused to listen to the Christian answer to this question because I kept on feeling, whatever you say, however clever your arguments are, isn't it much simpler and easier to say that the world was not made by any intelligent power? This was before he was a Christian. This was before he was a theist, when he was still an atheist. Aren't all your arguments simply a complicated attempt to avoid the obvious. My argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and many people that is of the world. Okay? So if the whole universe has no meaning, skip down to the end of that paragraph, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. If it was never meant to have any meaning, Lewis is saying, then we should never have this idea that it should have meaning. Okay, so, next chapter, the invasion. Then he starts off and says, well then, atheism is too simple. 
And there's another simple view that's too simple. He says the Christianity and water. The view that says, <laughs> this is my sister to a T. <laughs> there's a good God in heaven. I shouldn't say that because you might watch this at some point. There is a good, well, I've got three, so they won't know which one it is. There is a good God in heaven and everything is all right. Kind of the pie in the sky. And it's okay. Just believe. It's no good asking for a simple religion. Why? Things are not simple. Life gets messy, right? You know, what I'll often, what I will often write back to a student who sends me an email because they can't have an assignment done or they're not going to be a class. Because I'm this course, every semester I teach this course. I usually have no fewer than five. I usually have no. I usually have no fewer than five students, five or six, or email me and say, "I've had a death in the family. I've got a family member who's contracted cancer. I've had, and I'm not kidding. So far this semester, there's been five. I've had two deaths in the family. Two others were somebody's." Either a cancer or flesh-eating staph infection, you know, an arm's getting eaten off. And never fails to happen. So things aren't simple. So he goes on, skipping the next paragraph. Besides being complicated, reality in my experience is usually odd. It's not neat, not obvious, not what you expect. Is that your experience? Or does life just go swimmingly for you? You know, everything just falls in order. I know Paul got married the other day. Everything's just going great, right? I mean, just smooth as... Lumpiness is proof of reality. Lump? That ought to be a bumper sticker. Lumpiness is proof of reality. Reality, in fact, is something... Next paragraph. You could not have guessed... In other words, it's not what you would expect. Okay? And he says, and that's one of the reasons I believe Christianity. It's a religion you couldn't have guessed. What does that mean? He says, because there's a problem. Well, what's the problem? The universe that contains much that is obviously bad, apparently meaningless, but also having creatures like us who know that it's bad and meaningless. That doesn't make any sense. The universe has all kinds of crap going on with it, and yet we are here, and we know there's all kinds of crap going on with it. Talk about doubly sucking, <laughs> doubly being bad. There are only two views that face all the facts. One's a Christian view, good world gone wrong. The other is the dualist perspective. And the dualist perspective is essentially there is a good and there is a bad and they are constantly at war. Sometimes the good gets the upper hand and the bad falls away. And then other times the bad gets the upper hand. We saw it in the Lord of the Rings. What happens once the shadow is destroyed? It's never destroyed completely. It will always take shape and rise again. And at that time other people will have to rise up and confront it. If you've ever read the fantasy novels of Susan Cooper... Dark is rising sequence. This is her perspective. Dualism. The good and the bad, the light and the dark, are always badly. It's George Lucas. It's Star Wars. Okay? Always battling forth. Okay? So Lewis goes on. Well, but what do we mean when we call one of them the good power? Excuse me, and the other the bad power? Either we're merely saying we happen to prefer the one to the other, like preferring beer to cider, or else we're saying that whatever the two powers think about it, and whichever we humans at the moment happen to like, one of them is actually wrong, actually mistaken, it regarding itself as good. Okay, now notice the first part of that. We are wrong if we're saying this one's good and this one's bad because we like this one more. Good has nothing to do with what we like, per se. Okay? So, if we mean that 
if we mean merely that we happen to prefer the first, the one that we call good, he says, then we've got to give up talking about good and evil entirely. Because what does good and evil become? Mere preferences. I might prefer evil, and Owen might prefer what's good over here, or vice versa. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. So, good means what you ought to prefer quite regardless of what you happen to like at any given moment. How many of us always like what is good, what is best for us? No. You know, there are certain, certain foods I really like. I can't eat them because <laughs> they'll rip me up from the inside out. It's like, you know, alien. Okay? But I really, you know, like that kind of a thing. If being good meant simply joining the side you happen to fancy for no real reason, then good would not deserve to be called good. So we must mean that one of the two powers is actually wrong and the other actually right. Which gets us back to the old problem. But the moment you say that, you're putting into the solution, he says, into the universe, a third thing. The law or standard, go back to the first chapter. So in fact, what we mean by calling them good and bad turns out to be that one of them is in a right relation to the real ultimate God and the other is in a wrong relation. In other words, to use other language, one of them, and I'm going to use this thing over and over until you're going to hate me for it, one of them is actually true and the other one is Untrue, bent, fallen, declined. Okay? So, skip, um, going to the next paragraph about midway down, talking about wickedness and badness. He says, I mean that wickedness, when you examine it, turns out to be the pursuit of some good in the wrong way. Notice, wickedness doesn't necessarily have to be out and out, pure, unmitigated evil. It can be a pursuit of the good in the wrong way. What can be a pursuit of a good in the wrong way? Eating something, drinking something, doing something, saying something. Okay. You can be good, he says, for the mere sake of goodness. You can't be bad for the mere sake of badness. Not even Iago and Othello, who is perhaps Shakespeare's worst vile person, the most vile of his vile characters, is 100% pure evil. In other words, there is still some kind of good that he seeks, but he's Seeking it in the wrong way. Just as Sauron does. Just as Saruman does. After all, what does Saruman say? He seeks knowledge, order. Those are good things. He chooses the wrong means. What does uh, Darth Vader want? He wants peace in the galaxy. Wrong means, you know, blowing up planets that don't go along with his perspective. Okay? You can have peace as long as you kill everybody else. I mean, communism would work if I was the only one alive. Or Paul, or whichever one of you wants to be the last one standing. So if someone who's a serial killer, their good would be it makes him feel good? No, that would, that's an example, I think, where you have to get to what the overall or what the ultimate thing is they are seeking. I would say it's not necessarily that it's, it's that they are... Um, some fulfillment? That yeah. It might be some kind of fulfillment. It might be some kind of connection with another human being. But they're going about it in a very twisted fashion. Okay. So, um, in other words, badness cannot succeed even in being bad in the same way in which goodness is good. And here's why. He's going to say this later on. Because what is badness? What is evil? 
It's the absence of good. It's the spoiling good. What's an orc? A twisted elf. Okay. Badness or evil is always the perversion of something positive. Why? Because evil does not have existence in and of itself. For the simple reason that everything that exists, go back to Genesis, is good. By the very fact, according to Christian theology, by the very fact that God made it. Period. Existence in and of itself is good. Okay? So, badness is only spoiled goodness. There must be something good first before it can be spo uh, spoiled. Skip a couple sentences. It follows that this bad power, who is supposed to be on equal footing with the good power, and to love badness in the same way as the good power loves goodness, is a mere bogey, like a boogeyman. In order to be bad, he must have good things to want, and then to pursue in the wrong way. He must have impulses which were originally good in order to be able to pervert them, such as, I want to be like God. That can be, I want to be an imitator of God. Or it can be, I want to be like God. I want to be God. I want to, as the Bible says, put my throne above God's. That's where he takes the wrong step. So, he must be getting both from the good power. That is, the impulses which were good and the power to be able to pervert them. If so, then he is not independent. He is part of the good power's world. He was either made by the good power or by some power above them both. In which case, the good power isn't the ultimate power. And you just, you know, kind of played a game of musical chairs. So, Lewis says, to put it more simply, to be bad, he must exist and have intelligence and will. But existence, intelligence, will are in themselves good. So, back to your serial killer. The very fact that the serial killer exists is a good. Not that he's a serial killer, but that he is. Okay? Therefore, he must be getting them, that is the intelligence, existence, and will, from the good power. For even to be bad, he must borrow or steal from his opponent. Now do you begin to see why Christianity has always said that the devil is a fallen angel. It's not a mere story for children, Lewis says. It's a recognition of the fact that evil is a, I love this, parasite. It's like a tick. What do you do with ticks? Yeah, squash them, burn them, soak them in alcohol, all kinds of, you know, wonderful little torturous things. Okay? How do ticks feed? They have to have something else. Okay. Satan, which means what? The word has a very specific meaning. All it means is the adversary. It's what the word Satan means. The adversary. Okay? Or the opponent. The opponent, notice, the very meaning tells you everything. You can't be an opponent without someone or something first to oppose. Okay? Um, it's not a mere story. It's a real recognition of fact. Powers which enable evil to carry on are powers given it by goodness. So, Christianity skipping a bunch. Christianity, at the end of the next paragraph, agrees with dualism that the universe is at war. But it does not think this is a war between independent powers. In other words, it's not a war where at one point, you know, evil rises and has the upper hand, and goodness goes, oh no, I don't know if I'm going to win, whatever's going to happen. And then goodness rises and puts down evil for a while, and it goes back and forth in this ever kind of cyclical pattern. No. Christianity thinks it is a civil war, a rebellion, and that we're living in a part of the universe occupied by the world. In other words, we're behind enemy lines, as it were. So, enemy occupied territory. So when you go to church, Lewis writes, you're really listening into the secret wireless from our friends. If you're in Harry Potter, it's like when Harry and Hermione are out in the forest, and they're listening to the wireless, and they hear Kingsley get on the radio with Remus, and they talk about what's going on 
you know, on Potter Watch, okay, he, the enemy, does it by playing on our conceit and laziness and intellectual snobbery. Plays on what? He gets us to prevent, he tries to get us from going to church. So, a shocking alternative. Christians believe, he says, that an evil power has made himself for the present the prince of this world. Well, and that raises problems. Is this in accordance with God's will or not? If it's God's will, then why doesn't everything happen wonderfully? I mean, if God is all-powerful, and it is his will for there to be peace and happiness on the earth, then why isn't there peace and happiness? If it is God's will that things are the way they are, then he's strange, you'll say. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. So Lewis goes on, talking about freedom. God created things which had free will. That means creatures which can go either right or wrong. And Lewis likes to argue by analogy. Okay. He will often argue that we can understand things in the higher realm, let's say heavenly realm, by seeing how things work down here. Well, here's an analogy. Those of you who have children, you are kind of like God to your children. After all, you brought them into being. And then what do they start doing? Speaking. Speaking, yeah, thanks. And then acting and behaving and misbehaving and disobeying. What do you have with each parent that raises the child? You have a reliving of the Garden of Eden story. And usually not just once. <laughs> usually it's like multiple times a day. Pick up your stuff. No. And there he is, plucking that fruit. You know. No, I'm going to be my own God. You know. okay. Again and again and again. So, if a thing is to be free to be good, we could go off into politics on here, and boy, I'd really love to. It is also free to be banned. This is why an awful lot of laws that are passed are ridiculous. Because what are the legislators doing who are trying to pass some of these laws? Trying to take away our freedom to what? To make choose something. Decisions. To make bad decisions. The Board of Regents wants to save me from lung cancer. Actually, it's not the Board of Regents. It's MTSU. That's not a Board of Regents thing. So I don't smoke cigarettes, but I smoke cigars. And I used to, you know, every now and then, I wouldn't smoke them in my mouth, but I'd have one in my mouth and just chew on it. I love the taste of cigar tobacco. Okay? Can't even do that. Why? It's bad for me. Mommy McPhee, down in Cope, wants to stop me from doing something that he believes is bad for me. Okay? Same thing for you guys. It may not be as apparent. You know, after all, why is it there's only one kind of soft drink brand on campus? Why do you only have Pepsi or Pepsi products? Okay. Does that mean Pepsi's better for you than Coke? No, it means Pepsi paid them. Heck, a lot more money to put their products. We used to have Coke, and then Pepsi out bit them. Oh, the same thing with the smoking ban. They got like $3 million from the state health department or something like that to pass that ban. Yeah. I mean, I don't like walking through clouds of cigarette smoke. I don't like it, you know, when students would smoke outside the building right where the air intake was for the AC system. In my office, I'd walk in in the morning and would, I'm not kidding, smell like a bar, okay, because of that. But I would rather have you have the freedom, maybe with designated smoking areas on campus, have that freedom to choose. Why? Because where are you going to draw the line? Where is it going to end? Owen's got something back there on that table, which, frankly, I'll bet you within five years, there won't be, quote-unquote, sugary soft drinks on campus. 
Why? Because if Nanny Bloomberg in New York has his way, what they passed in New York will sweep across the country. And you won't be able to buy 22 ounce big gulps, and then 16 ounce, and then 12 ounce, and then 8 ounce. And then what else? As I told a student the other day, 10 years from now, all you're going to be able to eat on camp campus probably is cardboard and lettuce. Because those won't hurt you. They won't give you anything good, but they won't hurt you either. Okay? What is Lewis saying? Could God have made a different world where we did not have all the choices we have? Where we were not free? Sure. But if we're not free, then what happens? We're no fun. We're no fun and we're robots. Okay? So why did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. And you could go almost straight from there to, I don't have his name up, George Orwell's 1984. For those of you who have read 1984, how enjoyable is sentence in 1984? It's controlled. What about Brave New World? It doesn't exist. Well, it does, but it's not enjoyable. Why? Because it's dictated. Right? I mean, one of the pleasures of sex today is because it's uncontrolled to some extent. But we get more and more and more laws and such passed designed to remove that kind of freedom. Does that make people better? Do laws make you a more moral person? No, it just makes you sneakier. And also, we learn the consequences. So, if you don't allow us to have consequences, it doesn't really, you're not really teaching a lesson. Yeah. All right, we'll pick up here. I have no idea what we'll drop. We'll probably just shorten the space trilogy. And. I've got Paralandra. I've got a Paralandra lecture online. I might just do an, uh, in fact, I think I will, just do an online lecture for Out of the Silent Planet and that hideous strength so we can finish mere Christianity. Um, not because I'm trying to, you know, beat Lewis's religious beliefs into you, but because they're central to his writing. And then we'll get to his other stuff. Okay.